So uh, the topic of my talk is machine learning reconstruction of the inner magnetosphere. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use machine learning to really kind of take data from sat a satellite or various satellites and reconstruct it into a dynamic 3D environment. Uh, we've done this for a bunch of different kinds of quantities at this stage. I'm going to show you as an example, just plasma density, okay, cold density uh, of the order of one EV. That's going to be my working example. I'll show you what we've done and I'll show you how we kind of go about extracting science and insights out of it. Uh, I'm thanking my usual cast of characters, Xiang Ning Chu, uh, Dong Lai Ma is, I see somehow been left off the list, who's my student who has done a lot of this work uh, and uh, all my great uh, co-authors here. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to just drop me an email, jbortnick at gmail.com. Uh, so, um, I, one slide for the case for machine learning. I'm preaching to the choir, so I, I don't need to do more than one slide, but uh, the volumes of data in uh, the earth and space sciences uh, have been increasing and are increasing very, very rapidly. Uh, there was a study in, um, in the journal Science uh, and they, they looked at genomics data. And in the past, say, six year period, uh, of that paper, they noted a 10,000 fold increase in the amount of data available, right? In six years, if you just follow Moore's law, a doubling every 18 months, that should be a factor of 16 increase. But in fact, the data increased by a factor of 10,000. So the data amount is far in excess of a simple Moore's law type of exponential increase. And you can see here, for example, here are some large solar projects, um, Solar Dynamics Observatory, ATST, Gong. You can see how on an exponential curve, uh, it is growing uh, linearly on an exponential curve or you know, uh, exponentially as a function of time. Oh, sorry, my phone is just going crazy here. Okay. Um, and so the question is, um, is our knowledge, is our understanding improving together with the data? If we have a thousand times more data, do we have a thousand times more insight and understanding of our system? And I think the answer everybody knows is probably not, probably no. Um, and why is that? And how do we address that? How do we remedy the situation? What do we do with all that data to extract science and insight out of it? And what do we actually even mean by that? So this is going to be the, the frame setting for my talk. And so now let me tell you what it is that we do and how we do it. Um, so a few years ago, I, uh, I started thinking about a satellite. See, this is the Earth. The satellite goes around and around the Earth. And at every single point R, location R, you get one data sample. And then you wait some time, maybe a minute later, get another data sample and so on. And you kind of sample your system at just one point R uh, at a certain time T and you get a very long time series out of your spacecraft, maybe several years of data, uh, but at only one location over a very long period of time. And what you really want is to kind of invert this problem, kind of uh, put it, you know, turn it on its head. And what you want is only one time period and you want all the spatial points. You want kind of a 2D or 3D environment. And then as you step through time, you want to see this environment evolve. So how do you squeeze a long time series at one location at a time into this kind of 3D environment? So that's the basic problem that I wanted to address. And the, the goal statement here is given a sparse set of measurements of any quantity Q. For this uh, talk, we'll talk about plasmaspheric density, number density, electrons per cubic centimeter. But Q can be essentially anything that you measure on a satellite. And so you have this at a location R at a time T. You want to reconstruct this quantity Q over all R at a specific point in time T. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to train a machine learning model, specifically a neural network, to predict what the satellite should see at its different locations R at a certain time T based on a time history of a geomagnetic index. So for example, I'm using SIMH, which is just DST. It's the higher resolution version of DST. We want to train our neural network until, uh, this is called early stopping, until uh, the error on, not the training set, 
but the validation set starts to increase. That means we're starting to overtrain on our training set. And we want to stop at the point where the model is the most generalizable. In other words, it should be able to replicate data that it has not seen before. The idea is that it bakes in the dynamical behavior of your system. And so, uh, you know, a couple of notes about why we use neural networks. It has this mathematical property that it's a universal approximator, kind of like a um, polynomial series or a Fourier, um, Fourier, Fourier spectrum decomposition, um, Fourier series decomposition. As you add more terms, you get a better approximation of your function. And a neural network is kind of that kind of a mathematical model. It's the universal approximator. Uh, we use slightly deep neural networks because you get um, your inputs get rearranged into optimal features by itself. You don't have to guess what the important parts of your sim H time series are. The network kind of rearranges the time series into its own optimal representation to pass down into the remainder of the network. So this is just a few notes about the model. And so here's an example of uh, the result. So I've taken three Themis spacecraft, Themis A, D, and E, about a seven year period of plasma density observations, and I've trained a neural network to predict what the satellite should see at its location, trained on its data. And then once the model was trained in the way that I said in the previous slide, we then probed our neural network to say, well, what is the density at any location, at every location? What do you expect to see at a particular time? And so here's one example of a storm occurring on the 9th of March, 2008. These dashed red lines represent the snapshots corresponding to these panels. And so as you step through time, you can see that right away, the neural net has encoded within it the plasma sphere. See a dense region here of um, large plasma density, a kind of a more tenuous region out here and a very tenuous plasma trough out here. This is the night side. And as you step through the storm, you can see that the plasma sphere erodes and becomes smaller. There is kind of an evacuation region. This is called a plasma spheric drainage plume out of the day side. And so as you step through the storm, you can see that when you cut off convection, your plasma spheric drainage plume uh, stops forming and begins to co-rotate with the Earth, okay? And you see a little plasmospheric, plasmospheric drainage plume. Uh, none of this has been told to the model. The neural net has figured out all these features, all this behavior by itself, just based on very sparse satellite data. Right? So this is kind of like the magic of neural nets, is they kind of uh, figure out what is the most optimal uh, structure, what are the dynamics of your data. Uh, this was published in a paper in 2016, where I bold, boldly call it a unified approach to intermagnetospheric state prediction. It's unified because it doesn't matter what you put in as your target value or your output value of your neural network. It can be density, it can be energetic particle fluxes, and we've done a lot of work in radiation belts. Terry will speak about that next uh, in his project. Uh, we've done precipitation, plasma waves, and so on, and the model works just fine. Uh, and so, so this is why it's unified. You can apply it to all kinds of environments. Uh, obviously, you know, creating a model just for that specific value. You can create animations out of this. Here's an animation uh, of a, a 2D plasma sphere made in the same way from Themis AD and E data. This was now done by uh, my postdoc at the time, Xiangning Chu, published in a paper in 2017. Uh, it's a little jumpy because we, we don't sample every five minutes, we sample every half an hour. Uh, but you can see the same kind of behavior, erosion of the plasma sphere, day side plume, co-rotation after convection has been cut off. You can extend this model. Um, oh, before we extend this model, uh, a few notes about what we do in terms of scientific application. So, um, so you, you created this model. And so uh, now what? So let's try and use it for science. So the first thing is, um, we have a model that, that gives us plasma density at every location in space and in time. So the scientific utilities, you can just imagine what we can do with it. So the first thing we did was we said, well, what is the refilling rate of the plasma sphere? Once you erode the outer plasma sphere due to enhanced convection, how quickly does it refill? It tells you about the basic plasma physical processes that cause outflow out of the ionosphere and refill the plasma sphere. 
it's very hard to do experimentally. A spacecraft doesn't stand still at a certain location, um, right? It sort of, it does its orbit. And so it's hard to, to monitor a specific spot in the magnetosphere that co-rotates uh, with the Earth or stands still in magnetic local time. Um, you can do it with um, field line resonances, as people have done, but there again, there are complications. You're actually sampling the mass on that field line, not the electron number density, so some assumptions have to be made. But with a model, like a machine learning model, you can probe anywhere you want at any time. And, uh, and this is what we've done. You can co-rotate, you can stand still, uh, you can fly a satellite through your simulation, whatever you want. So here is a refilling rate, and as a function of L shell, We've done two cuts in the midnight and in the plume regions. And uh, we said, what is the density as a function of Alshal before the storm in black and at the sim H minimum in the middle of the storm and the recovery phase. And the refilling rate is just, you know, blue curve minus red curve divided by time gives you re your refilling rate as a function of Alshal at any location you want at any local time sector. And this is what we get. The blue curve and the red curve are our um, midnight and plume regions. These dashed curves are previously published refilling rates. You see that in certain regions, we have very, very good agreement, spot on. But in other regions, the data itself is telling you, you refill a lot slower here, and you refill a lot quicker here. And over here, there's a lot of disagreement with uh, your refilling rates. And so right away, you can see, this is what the data is doing. This is what it's actually showing you, right? This is not a model, um, it's, there are no assumptions. It's just what the data is doing, but it's represented to you in a different way that you can understand and analyze a whole lot better. Um, another thing you can do is just track the plasma pores, the, the region between the dense plasma sphere and tenuous outer uh, plasma trough. And you can, uh, this is something that has been done in the past, but we did it with a model as well. And um, you can see that we fit a model to the plasma pores of the form A times Q plus B, where Q is your, the log of the uh, sim H of the storm here. And we get these A and B coefficients, which are in very close agreement to previously published values, right? So this just comes out of our model. Uh, the next thing I want to show, and this is uh, the last kind of model I'll, that I'll show, is you can extend this analysis in three dimensions too. So here we don't just use Themis A, D, and E because those are essentially equatorial spacecraft, very close to the equator. But um, you know we use four different spacecraft: um, IC, DE1, Polar, uh, and so on. And um, you simply include latitude as another one of your features in the model. And so essentially for free out of old archive data that is not being used very much before, we built this three-dimensional model that is evolving in time and you can probe it. Here we are comparing to image RPI data. RPI is a radio plasma imager. And so this was done at great cost and a great complexity. And what image does is it sends uh, um, a Whistler echo up the field line and it gets the bounce down the field line, then you change the frequency and you kind of scan your field line. There are some assumptions there, but that's essentially kind of the only way you can redo really uh, a scan of the plasma density along your field line experimentally in situ, right? Uh, but uh, we, with our archived data from previous spacecraft, stitching them together and building a machine learning model. Uh, here's a neural network model uh, for latitude at different L shells. And now we're comparing to an image RPI scan. And you can see, for example, the cyan curve um, essentially overlaps almost completely what we get from a machine learning model kind of stitched together from di different data sets, different spacecraft, different time periods to this complicated and expensive observation. We can essentially overlap. Right, uh, we show 20% bar because this is kind of your experimental error. And you can see that each one of our uh, solid curves falls well within this 20% bar. Um, we've created a model that recreates, uh, recreates field line uh, density, densities, um, you know, all, almost as good as you can measure them, uh, just about. Okay, this is a completely out of sample prediction. Uh, this is the final thing I'm going to talk about. This is my final slide. Um, so now, how do you do inside discovery? 
Um, so now we have this three-dimensional model. And what we do is we just run it for different storms and we look at the results. We, we just look at them, we eyeball them. This is like taking a spacecraft data and looking at a time series, which a lot of people still you know, do their analysis in that way. But now we're looking at our spacecraft data and as it has been uh, reformulated for us in a way that is easier to understand and analyze by our machine learning model. So this is the density as a function of Al-Shal and time. And as the storm proceeds, this is DSD, SMH, we expect an erosion of the outer plasma sphere. This is expected, it's in all the models and a slow recovery later on. But look at this stuff. There are some enhancements here at the lower al -shals. And uh, when I was looking at this with Xiang Ning, uh, we thought this was probably an error, some kind of an overfitting thing, but we decided to look further into it. And so uh, going back to the original spacecraft data, we found that indeed these enhancements were there. Replotting this uh, as a density ratio of this density at a specific L shell normalized by what it was previous to the event, we see that actually we have these large spikes at L of 2.5, L of 2, L of 3, increases in the density, not expressed, not captured in any model. Uh, this is a complete surprise to us, but coincident with peaks in AL. Uh, those peaks in the AL correspond to injections from the tail. Okay, that's what AL typically represents. And so uh, let's now look at what actually happens during one of these peaks in AL, for example, this one, if we take a snapshot from here, and you can see that in the meridional cut, this is slightly prior to the AL peak, and this is during the AL peak. The intensification is here, it's an ionosphere, right? The model, without being told anything, just rebuilding our data from the satellites is telling us that when you have an injection, an AL intensification, the ionosphere kind of gets heated up or something, scale height increases, and you have this apparent outflow at very low L shells, L2, 2.5, or thereabouts. So this is a discovery for us. Um, this was something that we were not expecting before. It could only have been made by looking at our data in this unique way that our machine learning was able to give to us. And uh, something that I'll stress is that uh, the machine learning model didn't make the discovery. It just represented the data for us in a convenient way. The discovery came in our minds, right? You're, you're always discovering things uh, based on your own understanding. And so the machine learning here is not the end goal. It's a tool to help us um, understand our data and our system in a better way. So. Um, oh, sorry, this is the final slide. Uh, so to verify this, uh, we searched for an event, uh, a substorm event, an AL peak, uh, where we had completely out of sample data. So this is now image in situ data. And we show that as you progress through the storm, so black to red to yellow, uh, we see a density enhancement going from black to the red, only on the night side, only in association with this peak and then the density dies down uh, as a function of Al-Shal and the yellow and the purple back down to ambient levels. And so this peak happened in coincidence with the AL intensification. On the night side, as exactly as predicted by a machine learning model, look at the day side for this exact period, and you can see that there's no such effect at lower Al-Shals on the day side. It's only a night side phenomenon, and it's fairly transient. It just follows AL, but it's there in other data sets too, not just in the training data set that we use for our machine learning model. Now I'm done. So this is what I said, the scientific data is growing. We're looking for a new approach to extract the science out of our data. This is just one approach. It's just one quantity that I've showed, but I hope it gives you some idea or some notion of how you can use a very big data set together with machine learning to represent your data in a in new and um, convenient way that you can analyze and uh, make your own discoveries. So I'll stop right there.